Yeah, so welcome everyone. It's an honor for me to be here uh, in the second global workshop of the Open Air Monitor project. As um, it was already mentioned, today I will present the results of our package that is how to quantify the heterogeneity for eddy covariance flat towers. Before I go into the presentation, I will click. Uh, I want to quickly mention that um, this task or this project is part of the task 4.9, and that is integration and harmonization between in situ and graded data, and task 6.10, uh, sorry, that is development of a world carbon flux monitor. So back to the basics, the decovariance towers measure the change of energy and matter between the biosphere and the atmosphere. Then with this information, scientists can derive ecosystem fluxes as gross primary production. That is the amount of carbon that is absorbed by plants uh, through photosynthesis. Eddy covariance towers usually are clustered in different networks. One, uh, the biggest network is Flatsnet and yeah, the eddy covariance towers that are part of net, uh, Flatsnet um, range across the entire globe, but most of the towers are located in the US and in the US and Europe. Now, one of the limits of the decovariance tower is that the range that can sense, it varies from a few hundred meters around the tower to a few kilometers around the tower. This is what we call uh, the tower footprint. Now, that's why to have estimations around uh, for bigger areas, usually the covariance towers are combined with remote sensing information, mainly from satellite missions, to uh, train machine learning models or to calibrate mechanistic models and have global estimations or ecosystem plots as well as GPP or gross primary production. Now, usually when ecosystem plots are upscale, scientists assume that the landscape where the decovariance tower is located is homogeneous. So here we have an example for two towers, one in Brazil and one in the US. However, most of the towers are located in landscapes or ecosystem with different degrees of fragmentations, with different plant functional types and different elements that, uh, uh, that break the assumption of homogeneity in the pixel. For this reason, it is important to quantify the heterogeneity between the footprint of the tower and the, the, the footprint of a satellite sensor. So in this project, we define a dynamic indicator to compare the footprint of an in-situ observation and the spatial resolution of a satellite. So here we have an example of one side, the blue circle represents uh, the footprint of the tower and the, uh, sorry, the purple represent, and the other two represent two different satellites. Then we have the distribution of the data for a vegetation index. And now the question is how to define if the distributions are the same or how much is the difference between the distribution. So at the end, it's a, st a statistical problem. So to uh, solve this problem, we use the Jensen channel distance. And we choose this one basically because it's bounded from 0 to 1. Is based on um, mutual information this and uh, divergence from kullback lewis So to understand um, Jensen Shannon, we first need to understand kullback lewis So let's say that we have two probability, um, f uh, sorry, two probability distributions p and q, and then the idea is to compare the probabilities uh, at certain points and then we estimate the ratio between these points. For example, here we take the first point, P, uh, the probability P of X, and estimate the, uh, the log phase two of P over Q. Then, as 
both distribution integrate to one, if we just summarize everything, it will get zero. So to have into account this, we gave more weight to the positive estimations when estimating Kullback Leuven. Yeah, so I will pass this. And there we have the Kullback Leuven divergence. Now, the Jensen Shannon is, uh, let's say, uh, two ways Kullback Leuven divergence. First, you estimate the Kullback Leuven divergence diverging from P to Q, and then from Q to P. And then you get the Jensen channel divergence. And then, as the information is uh, expressed in terms of bits, you can use the R square to have a metric bounded from 0 to 1, where 0 means that both distributions, uh, ah, sorry. In our case, uh, to have more um, interpretable, let's say more, yeah, just for the purpose of interpretation, we say that the Jensen channel distance is one minus the square of Jensen channel divergence. Then we have a metric where zero means that the distribution doesn't, uh, don't share any information and one where the distribution share all the information, the same information. As data, we select 178 flatnet sites uh, located around the globe that cover different vegetation types. What? Uh, something is wrong with the presentation. Okay, maybe the title was wrong, sorry. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, we collect Sentinel-2 images for each one of the sites. For this, we use Google Earth Engine. Uh, then we define a bounding box of 10 kilometers around the tower uh, for the time period of 2016 until 2024. Then we extract the red, near infrared, and the scene classification map. We filter the clouds, and then we compute the KNDVI. So here I want to stress that Sigma in the formula is not just the average distance or half the distance between the near infrared band and the red band. But this needs to be uh, computed using the entire time series. So basically, you average the entire time series, and then you have sigma. Otherwise, the index is not properly computed. Then we divide the analysis in, into sections. In the first one, we create a spatial composite where we evaluate the spatial sensitivity for each one of the sites. And then we define different uh, eddy covariance footprints of 100 meters, 500 meters, and one kilometers uh, diameter around the tower. And we use compute different satellite resolutions or satellite footprints that is a continuous gradient between uh, up to 10 kilometers. So here in this scheme, this plot, uh, the blue line represents the tower, and the others represent the different radius. On the second part of the analysis, uh, we compute we compute the time series. Uh, we perform the Jensen channel for uh, using the time series. I mean, we compute the the same analysis, but for each image individually after cloud filtering. Now, into the results. As I mentioned previously, uh, sorry, I think the pointer is not working, or there is no. Okay. On the top, we have the tower footprint that is equal to 100 meters, 500 meters, and one kilometer. In the y-axis, we have 1 minus the Jensen channel. Remember that 1 means that both distributions or at that uh, share the same information, and 0 means that the distribution doesn't share any information at all. And then the color represents different sites. So we can see, for example, and the vertical lines represent different bits of resolution. So let's say we have a 5-kilometer resolution for the type uh, ITSR2, we have that the 
information share between the Jensen Shannon, uh, uh, sorry, the information share between the uh, eddy covariance footprint and the satellite footprint is less than 0 0.4. That means that less than 40% of information that exists in the tower is shared with the satellite. We also notice that uh, when we increase the tower footprint, of course, more information is shared um, by the satellite and so on and so forth. Now, when we do this for all the sites, the information gets a bit hard to read. So what we did was to select three different uh, Jensen Shannon thresholds, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and 0 0.9, and compute the number of sites that reach this condition. So here, for example, you see that considering a tower footprint of, one, uh, of 100 meters, of course, when we compare with a um, satellite footprint of 100 meters, we have all the sites. But then, <coughs> sorry, when considering a Jensen Shannon threshold of 0 0.7 and a spatial resolution of 500 meters, we found that only half of the sites available in the uh, sorry, in the Plotsen network is suitable for local comparison. We also compute this, but considering all the PFTs, that's why you have in the left side. Uh, and then we notice that the proportion of different PFTs for a certain, dis uh, for a certain pixel resolution is not necessarily stable. You see, for example, that there are some moments where uh, the number of sites increase again. That means that there is more uh, pixel available, available with the same vegetation signal for that site. And then that's why we have here the ratio base in the into the percentage that basically tell us uh, for this specific resolution how much is the how, how many sites we have from different PFT. So for example, if you check at the beginning from zero sorry, to from 100 to 250 meters, most of the sites that we have are um, evergreen nearly forest, but if we move from one kilometer to five kilometers, actually most of the sites that we have are evergreen broadly forest. On the temporal results, um, here I present two sites, one is uh, in Canada and the other one in Austria. And just to show an example of the, huh? Australia, sorry, uh, of, of the temporal variability for different sites. So for the first time, uh, we have a seasonal cycle that is quite clear. For the second one, we have a signal that is quite stable. That means that probably, uh, no, that means that the signal for the second site the phenological signal match completely all the time in between the satellite and the site, while for the second there is a mismatch in the phenological signal. Then we compute, sorry, uh, then to summarize all the information, we compute the, this is called peak to peak, the amplitude of the signal, which is basically the peak in the valley plus the peak in the top. And we compute the distances for all the sites. And then we have that most of the sites have uh, let, uh, amplitude peak to peak between 0 0.5% and 5% and 15%. That means that yeah, we can expect a temporal variability between 5% to 15% for each site. On the other hand, we also find, uh, found that for some sites, we were able to track uh, disturbances. For example, this is a site in the US where you see that in 2021, there was some changes completely in the signal, probably produced by uh, changes on land use or different crops that are used close to the covariance towers. 
Uh, I would like to mention that uh, now, thanks to our partners, Synergize and Brockman Consulting that have been supporting us, it is possible to run the analysis of the heterogeneity for any, s any site in the world using the um, Copernicus data space ecosystem. For this, we produce uh, three notebooks where the user can choose a point, different ratio size, and perform the same analysis on the fly in the cloud using the credits provided by the Copernicus data space ecosystem. Uh, right now, the notebooks are private, but we are planning to release it after the publication of the study. So, to conclude, we found that the Jensen channel distance measure the shared information between the local vegetation signal at uh, Eddy Covariance Tower footprint and, and a coarser satellite footprint. We found that with a 70% information threshold, only half of the flattened sites are suitable for training and validation. Uh, we found that most of the flattened sites showed only 5 to 10% of temporal variability in the similarity between uh, the tower and the satellite footprint. W we provide tools where the users can run the analysis on demand via the Copernicus Data Space Ecosystem. And now this is more like uh, something to be tested that how the Jensen channel distance can be used to uh, improve models for example, waiting the, uh, waiting the observation during the regression phase or during the training phase. For sure, uh, we are working in a publication of this study that should be available in the coming months. Now, as an outlook, at the beginning I mentioned that for data acquisition we use uh, Google Air Engine because we were developing and prototyping at the same time that we were uh, working on the on the site project, or yeah, on a, on a different phase of the project. So the now that we have the prototype ready, we can use the co now the, the challenge is to use the Copernicus Data Space ecosystem for run the entire analysis over there. Uh, something to consider, we are still thinking about it. Is for sure the footprint of the covariance tower. It's not a static, but it's changing in time, basically minute to minute, uh, depending on the wind conditions, surface roughness. So we are thinking if we shall incorporate a proper footprint model at this stage, or maybe if keep it for later for a different study. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm looking forward for your questions.